What a terrific project. It's been great to watch this um, project evolve, and I've been hearing about it for months now. And when, um, when Jason called a few months ago, a couple months ago now, and, and um, we started talking about the possibility of premiering it here at the New York Film Festival, we were, we were just uh, thrilled. I was just thrilled at the opportunity because it's such a um, such an exciting project, and I think as you can see from the work we've seen here, um, so rich and detailed, and, and there's just so much more to see, which I'll, we're all very really excited to be able to check it out later this week, or you know tonight even. Um, I have a couple questions about what I was thinking of doing, this is kind of inverting it, rather than... Uh, <laughs> That's Jackie's code. <laughs> uh, battery may go up soon. But um, rather, than, um, rather than my starting the conversation, I actually want to let you start the conversation, and I'll cover my questions in um, as we go along, because we only have a certain amount of time, a short amount of time, to, uh, to, to take this conversation um, in any direction you might want to take it. So if you have a question, raise your hand, and I will repeat it. And then I'll throw some questions out myself as well. We'll start right here in the third row. Oh, hi. So I really enjoyed watching this. And I'm wondering about your inspiration for this project. And in particular, I also wondered, when I think of high rise, I also think of office towers and office conditions as well. So I wondered why you decided to focus on apartment living conditions. The question is about inspiration and also why you chose to focus on apartment living condition conditions. Thanks for the question. Um, I'm actually, I, I'm a director at the National Film Board of Canada uh, in Toronto, based in Toronto, and I've actually been working on a project called High Rise for the last four years with Jerry Blahive and, and Tom Perlmutter, who's the, um, our, our head at the, the National Film Board, is here with us tonight too. And, and so High Rise is really an experiment in both form and in content. And the reason we chose the High Rise building, for me personally, I think it, it's, it's, it's an incredible storytelling prism. Um, for how we live and how we have lived and how we can live and 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 it became such a simple and yet almost um, endless way of being able to look at global issues and so there's other documentaries that we've done prior to this one and there's more to come as well within the high rise umbrella at the National Film Board and this project we were actually approached by Jason from the New York Times you know he'd heard of you know high rise and he thought he was starting up op docs he thought well high rise in New York City maybe maybe there's something there. And uh, that's how, how it all started. Um, but we really we, we are interested. It's less about the architecture, and it's more about housing and, and where we live out our lives. So that's, that's the, the, the motivation. Maybe I could ask uh, Jason and Jerry to put, sort of put a little more meat on the bones there and just come talk about how the relationship came together. Obviously, the Times is, uh, is doing so much um, and really pushing um, uh, the envelope in, in terms of the creativity of telling stories, um, expressing stories, journalistic stories, creative stories in, in different ways. Uh, and certainly the NFB has, um, has a very rich tradition. Um, so can we talk a little bit about how these two organizations, these institutions came together and, and maybe talk about the inspiration from that perspective as well? Sure. Well, um, OpDocs launched nearly two years ago as a forum for independent filmmakers to contribute short opinion documentaries to the Times as an extension of op-ed. And we've really encouraged creative filmmaking and very unique voices. And now we've published nearly 80, um, or maybe, maybe we have crossed 80 short documentaries, but we thought it would be exciting to also try an interactive documentary by an independent filmmaker, something very creative and that has a different sensibility than you'd expect with an interactive news project and to also tap the resources of this team, which I think is really one of the finest interactive documentary teams in the world. So it was a bit of an experiment for us, like could we collaborate with an outside group? What would it look like? But we thought, well, we've done it with a lot of filmmakers now. Um, could we do it with an interactive group? It, it's a lot harder than a five minute video <laughs> to do something like this. It's been a year of work, but I think these, they bring so much expertise in this particular realm in terms of the subject matter and the technology that um, we're very fortunate. Well, for, for us, uh, the short form documentary has been a hallmark of the film board's work over 75 years. We've made 14,000 films, and not all of them have been long form. Some have been short. So when OpDoc started, it felt like a very natural partnership, a natural place, somewhere that really honored the author's voice, the filmmaker's voice, in a very short form. And, and some of the films Jason has, has brought uh, together are, are absolutely extraordinary. So it felt like a very good fit. But for us as well, as Kat said, High Rise, we proposed High Rise as a kind of platform agnostic project in 2009 at the Film Board. 
and I, I don't think there's anywhere else in the world we would be given such creative license and, and responsibility to essentially say, we don't know what we're going to make, we don't know the things we're going to make, but they're all going to be documentary of different kinds, and we embrace all new platforms and technologies to tell the, the stories of people living vertically. So working with the New York Times, and when Jason said, you know, you can have access to the archives to the morgue, five, six million, I mean, we'd still be down there, I think, if we <laughs> didn't pull a cat out of there. Uh, it's just, a, you know, I think um, filmmaking, documentary filmmaking and interactive are seen as sort of two different things. Not for us at the film board, and I think the Times has been doing extraordinary work with you know interactive multimedia projects. It's all documentary. I think documentary is a vibrant, growing form, and uh, I think this is actually the golden age right now. We're in a very very early uh, early stage, and the forms haven't been fixed yet. So it's time to play and experiment, and so it's an incredible honor to work with the people at the Times on, on this project. Let's take some more questions. Let's go here, Jim. Thank you. Uh, Jackie, I can hardly wait to get home and put my fingers on the computer. And it really looked beautiful on the big screen. I hope you liked it. My question has to do, I was t completely aghast at the music choices. They're the best people in Canada, a Cole Speck and, and Patrick Watson and Feist. Can, how did you ch make that decision to have them talk, for the most part, rather than sing? Because it's, a, it's an element of storytelling which is so important to people like myself. Question for Jackie about music choices and, and the choice of the decision to have the, these musical artists uh, speak. Oh, well, uh, Al actually sent that over to Kat because she was really the one who <laughs> made those decisions. Because the text is written in rhyme, um, I just felt that, that a musician might bring a musical quality to the presentation. Uh, the vocal presentation of the material, rather than having sort of your standard documentary, the sort of voice of God kind of, um, and and it was interesting because neither Cold Specs nor Feist have ever narrated before, and it was just wonderful to to work with them. Um, Feist doesn't record with headphones on, ever, like with her music. So it was really really fun, you know, really interesting to record narration that had all been really fixed, and it was you know the the film was done. We just were bringing in the voice, and so it was really interesting to see. You know, where does narration, where does voice, where does text, where does um, story mix with musical delivery? And I, and I think they, they did a really amazing job. So, yeah, and, and the music off the top is Jim Guthrie, who's another fabulous um, uh, Canadian musician. And he, did, he scored all the, um, the interactive elements. He's, he's known in the gaming world as well. He's done a lot of great work for Canadian games. So, yeah, thank you for noticing that. Here in the second row, and then we'll work our way back. Hi. Okay, um, yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I teach uh, courses in urban sociology, which this is uh, kind of uh, blowing my little pea brain. And um, <laughs> I'm really struck by the uh, that you drill down to um, uh, being able to see at least comparative ideological uh, views of, uh, of of the constructed environment and so on. And I also wondered, so I wanted to hope that that gets defended and flourishes. And also, I, I wanted to also say that um, will there be more or, uh, contemplated on looking at um, the uh, kinds of um, uh, interaction and the footprint on the natural environment and the fragility and the um, you know the storms uh, looming in that respect as well as part of this. So I guess part of the question is will you do more? Uh, maybe the, to broaden the question, not only the uh, impact on the environment, but I guess the the, the impact of of the high rise on its surroundings and on its urban environment. Uh, maybe that's part, a part of a, that's part of the broader question also. A huge part of the inspiration for this project comes from this uh, movement of tower renewal, uh, which we learned about, um, Jerry and I learned about a few years ago from ERA, an architecture firm in Toronto that has been sort of analyzing tower renewal around the world. It very much speaks to the environmental question of, you know, does it make sense to knock down these buildings that have been considered uh, a failure? Or you know, can we reconsider that building and, and, and rethink it and, and save the energy that has been put into it, that's been embodied in, in, in the building? So uh, definitely on that side, I think there's been a strong, um, strong uh, meditation on, on the environmental question. Um, and, and the future projects that we're, we're, we're hoping to do with High Rise involves um, more about the people inside again and the sociology aspect of probably the work that you might do. Um, and we have Deb Cowan, who is a geographer at the University of Toronto, and Emily Paradis as well, 
who we're working on the next project there in the audience with us tonight, and, and we'll be looking at digital citizenship, so notions of urban citizenship and high-rise citizenship in a globalized world within, within the high-rise structure. So um, we're addressing a lot of those kinds of questions as well. Some other questions from the audience? There was someone up here. I'll go back, back there, and then we'll come forward again. Yes, hi. Yes. The question is how you landed on the rhyming script. I was really interested in the tablet as a new device, something that, that kind of offered an experience somewhere between cinema and reading and just a new kind of way of interacting with, with material that, that, that the desktop doesn't quite do. And so I just started looking at a lot of tablet projects and the most successful stuff is actually in children's literature. I mean, that's where a lot of the best kind of really innovative and exciting um, reading cinematic experiences happen. And, um, and then confronted with 2,500 years of history, I didn't know how I was going <laughs> to fit it into like, you know, op-docs format and maybe maximum eight minutes per film. And so um, I, I was writing these documentary scripts that were just like pages and pages. And then I, I thought of the storybooks and I thought, well, okay, let's just try this. Let's see if it works. It's going to be probably really stupid, but let's just try. And, and it just, it, I wrote it in it, literally in 20 minutes, like the first film, because suddenly that the, there's something about the rhyme that gives an efficiency to the language and, and to moving through time. But the rhythm also allows the audience to know, like, like you kind of know where you are in the story when there's rhyme as well. And then it also, gives it this, um, ennobles the material, I think, you know, this everyday common building that we tend to ignore it becomes elevated into something that's worthy of a story, you know, story, storybook rhymes are epic stories. They're the stories of humanity and of good and evil. Those are the big stories. And, and so there's something that really worked. And then also the pop-up features, you know, the ability to touch things and have them react. So. Let me ask a follow-up for Kat. I want to ask you sort of to talk about or give us a little bit of insight into the notion of directing for um, multiple platforms that, uh, to use Jerry, Jerry's words earlier, are still defining themselves. These platforms are still emerging as, as ways for uh, creators to express themselves. Can you speak to sort of the nuance or, or maybe the experience of directing for this, these variety of platforms? A lot of it is experimentation and working with uh, someone like Jackie, who has incredible experience in design and, and developing and, and really through the, the conversations that we had at a very microscopic level about how how is something going to pull up or pull over and, and it's, it becomes very tactile and very technical very quickly um, but you can't lose the, the, the perspective of that user experience and maybe Jackie can speak a little bit about working, uh, you know, I'm curious to know because we haven't even had this conversation yet. Um, Jackie is, is really the designer and the developer behind uh, the Snowfall project at the New York Times. So I'm curious to know from you, Jackie, how, you know, that was very much about reading and enhancing the reading experience. How is it to move over to something that's more about watching and, and audiovisual material? Yeah, it was an interesting challenge because with video, you traditionally kind of lean back. Um, and watch and watch a film, but we really wanted to entice people to kind of weave in and out between all of the like extra interactive and dig down chapters. And so it was sort of a balance between not being intrusive, but also sort of giving nice hints like, all right, there's something nice down here. You can really, you know, go down and discover something, discover something new. So that was a really interesting challenge. And in getting into the details, really, you know, you can get lost in the weeds, but like that really enhances the overall experience. And it was a lot of experimentation, for sure. Let me ask Jackie a follow up. Uh, Jackie, is, uh, maybe you could explain to the audience, for those who may not know the term, but sort of the idea of UI. And is there a philosophy to that? Or what is your philosophy? Um, how do you sort of. Uh, tell us about how you think about the way that a user will interact with a work and, that, and the ways that you bring that philosophy to a collaboration with the director and others. Oh, well, uh, UI is user interface, but um, I think my approach is tr to try to be as minimal as possible, but um, as intuitive as possible. So that, that can be a pretty big challenge. Um, I think when we're working on this project, there was a lot of discussion of how to, to inform people of, of what to do, like to 
let them know that they can swipe down at a certain point or scrub through or that there were different <coughs> chapters in these different parts of, of the project. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of trying things out and seeing if they work. What's cool about the way Jackie built this is that there's essentially one engine that drives the project in, on, no matter what device you're on. Um, but then I guess where it really started becoming problematic was that we sort of thought about it on the tablet, but we were mostly looking at it on desktop. And then when we started user testing uh, on the different devices, people were just confused about like the terms like swipe up or click down. So, um, but essentially, it's always the same action. And I think that's what's so beautiful about this project is that it really, uh, it feels native on every device you're on in the end. And, and then it's, it's, it's really just about the little nuance, nuances that make the difference. I hope I'm not giving too much away. I walked into this room a few minutes before we opened the doors, and Kat and Jackie were at the computer, and I looked up at the screen, and there was a whole screen of code on the screen, and Jackie was doing some coding. Um, uh, when is a project like this finished? How do you, how do you, you know, with a movie, it's, it's, there's one thing, but with, with a project like this, you could, you, you're still tweaking, you're still playing with it, I'm sure you will be until Friday. I mean, are you oh still? yes, definitely till Friday. Even after Friday, maybe. <laughs> Probably after till Friday. We, we feel the tell credits are too short. We need to add uh, longer credits. And, uh, so you're seeing you're seeing the, the the latest possible version that was just uh, you know tweaked moments before you walked in. Uh, let's take a few more questions from the audience. Hi, right here. Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to thank the director for taking on a subject that's usually so broad and not simply you know, especially in New York. High rises are either seen as neighborhood destroyers. It was also cool seeing some buildings that I worked on um, in the movie. But I, I was just curious if there are any plans to partner with film boards in other countries to uh, create some more kind of indoor version of the film. Question about collaborating with organizations in other countries to perhaps create uh, multilingual versions or, or extensions of some of these projects or this project in particular. Um, we, we've, we've done some language versions of some of our earlier projects we did actually tried out some crowdsourcing of translation. I mean, it's, in, it's extremely expensive and we, um, as an agency of the Government of Canada, will, the films will be available in French as well as English. With interactive, as you can see, it's, there's, there's text, there's audio, there's graphics that are built out of text, so it's, you know, it would be extremely uh, expensive and difficult to make them into multiple versions. I think that is definitely coming. Uh, for sure, but we're not quite there yet. But on uh, our other work in High Rise, we have collaborated with people uh, all over the world. Uh, one of our projects called Out My Window looks at a 360 degree view inside 13 apartments in 13 cities all over the world. And our, I think the credit list was even longer than the credit list for this one, because uh, we had hundreds of people, of photographers and, and ordinary folk, um, who just help us tell these stories. So it's, uh, Kat directed some of those over Skype. Um, so we're also, you know, embracing new technology to, in, in the making of these projects and, and in the sharing of them and the, the building of them. But I think, um, you know, the extraordinary thing about doing documentary work on the web is when you see the analytics, people suddenly, you know, one of our projects is about one high-rise building in Toronto. It's a community in, in the northern part of Toronto. Within two days of it being live, people in 180 countries had seen it. And that doesn't happen when you make a documentary film and put it out in film festivals, I'm sorry Eugene, um, okay. you know, you reach this international audience instantly and people find your project uh, in all sorts of ways you never expected. You find new audiences who aren't even there because they're interested in documentary, they just, they find one piece of it and it means something to them. So I feel we've always had a kind of international footprint for the High Rise Project and we'll continue to, but we also have very strong roots in Toronto, which when we started, we discovered is one of the most vertical cities in the world and nobody noticed because the buildings are, are 1,200 buildings spread all over the, the city and the suburbs, so um, it's, it's a learning process for us as well. Let's try to get a couple more questions in in the few moments we have left. We'll do one here and then we'll go over here. Yes. It's a comment. When I've met people from Yemen and complimented them on the beauty of these high-rise buildings in Sana'a, they were usually very surprised that people from other places realized how beautiful they were. So um, I hope certainly that there will be an Arabic language uh, version of the uh, documentary or the project that will be able to be seen by people in the Middle East and in Yemen. 
comment from an audience member hoping that there will be an Arabic version specifically for uh, an opportunity to reach those in Yemen specifically. Right. Yes? Uh, it's often difficult, in, particularly in this kind of presentation, to understand what the point or the scope of a project is. You've mentioned a lot of other high-rise projects, which makes me wonder immediately, is there any intention to link them all together and make something that's comprehensive? It's also a little hard to figure out whether the, what the goal of this particular project was, since I can't tell whether it's to make a few little pieces that are interesting about aspects of the high-rise and then be able to dig deeper, or whether there's some more overreaching purpose to this part and how that fits into your larger high-rise project. And well, this will be our final question. We're almost out of time, but it's, a, but it's an appropriate one and a good place to conclude because it gives us an opportunity to kind of restate uh, for Kat and everybody on the panel to kind of restate the goals, but also the question is specifically about how this project fits into the greater context of other high-rise projects. You're working on it. You've been working on a project called High Rise, um, but also to maybe help an audience who hasn't experienced this yet in a tablet form or another form um, and had their hands in it yet. Um, a, a way, a way in. You know, they're, 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 we're looking. We talked earlier about having this new, this new type of um, cinematic, if you will, approach to storytelling. Um, but the the entry point and the exit points are are defined much less clearly than they would have been ten years ago for a documentary. So maybe anyone who'd like to speak to some of those issues as we wrap one, up would be great. Just one thing about audience. I, I think this will hopefully reach a different audience than would watch a traditional, say, news piece about high-rises or a traditional, like, one-hour CNN documentary about high-rises, it's really enjoyable. It's just really a pleasurable experience. And without even really realizing it, you absorb a lot of information about the global history of high-rises over, you know, more than 2,000 years. So I think this approach, it tells this very large history, but it also tells it in a way that could intrigue and involve a lot of people in new ways. I, and that's always been one of the appeals for the times getting involved in it. Part of the joy and challenge of working on a project like High Rise, um, which is in, a, in some respects a living documentary, we're, we're inviting people to be part of it as we're making it. So, you know, as we have the different iterations, people come in and, and that's really what allowed us to make this collaboration, have this collaboration with the New York Times because we didn't, you know, work on something for five years and then release it. We release things along the way and, and we invite people to come and, 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 and become part of the conversation around um, a, a, an area that has been really ignored, I think. Um, not just the high rise, but also the peripheral areas of our, of our cities, the suburbs which are, um, in, in our view, really the most important part of our cities, growing, growingly important. And so um, in that way, it becomes this, this organ that we don't necessarily know what it's going to be at the end, but I think that's what, that's what kind of excites people. And, and we certainly were worried about that at the beginning, but I think our numbers and the, the interest and the kind of collaborations we've been able to develop along the way that we never would have been able to do in a traditional and conventional approach to a documentary form has been incredibly rewarding and, and I think um, exciting about uh, in, in, the, in the way that we're able to treat the subject, think about it, and collaborate directly with academics. I mean, right now we, we've got, um, uh, with Emily and Deb, we, we're working on an academic grant and we're, um, we're doing research while we're making a documentary. So often documentaries kind of get the rights to the book and then make the film about the book and, and we're writing the book while we're <laughs> while we're making the, the project and, and, and it's it's a very different way. It's a, it's an interventionist way of thinking about the role of media and documentary in, in, in our understanding of the world. So I, I would say too we uh, for the high risk project we have no ambition to be comprehensive. I, I actually think the comprehensive is the enemy of the documentary. It's it's a kind of framework that too often television document if we did this as a television documentary would have been four hours on the future of the city. You know, there would have been this sort of rapid, like the coffee table book. And I think that a lot of amazing stories get missed in that effort to pretend to be comprehensive. Um, it will be a collection of things. Everything we've done is at our site. So all of our projects, um, and this, this project launches at New York Times, but ultimately everything we do in the project will be at the nfb.ca website. And I think what we've really embraced, what documentary is really good at, I think it's almost its best thing, is showing you something that's right in front of your face that you haven't noticed. Um, you know, that's not what current affairs and television documentary does. That's what 
real documentary filmmaking and the kind of documentaries that get shown at this festival. And I think that's what interactive can do too. So we're not we're not attempting to be encyclopedic. We're really just trying to peel back the layers of those anonymous buildings that you drive past, those high rises that nobody pays attention to, and say there are important human stories there. And that's that's all we're trying to do. The, uh, your question is so appropriate because this is um, and this is our final event in this space for this weekend. We've had um, the 51st New York Film Festival, and for the first um, uh, weekend of that festival, through and through, including today. Uh, we've been trying to answer that very question that you've been asking, so we come back to that question over and over in this Convergence program, which is a new part of this festival, just a couple years old. Um, and we're still figuring that out as well. How does an audience interact with projects like this and through the exciting creativity that we're seeing in the field um, in so many different parts of the world? And if anybody's been here for Convergence this past weekend, you've seen work from everywhere. Um, there's some really interesting explorations of the way that creators can use these platforms and also the way audiences have an opportunity to access them. Um, so that's been really exciting. We couldn't have um, had, had a better opportunity to close with anything more exciting than, than this particular project. It's been actually really exciting to have uh, Jason and Jerry, Jackie, and, and Kat here with us. Uh, Jim has a question. You, well, I just wondered if our Canadian friends had any latest word on John Grayson, the Canadian filmmaker who's in prison in Egypt. Thank you. Question about John Grayson. I, I think uh, uh, we, filmmaker. we're not sure. I mean, sadly, I think he and his colleague, uh, Tarek, have, uh, they're, they're at least another 45 days in jail, uh, latest. But uh, as far as I know, I might be wrong, our Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Harper, has made now a direct appeal to the Egyptian government. I hope that. Uh, John, John's a, you know, a colleague of a lot of, uh, of, a lot of uh, us in, in Canada. And uh, I don't know if people realize that you know, a Canadian documentary filmmaker, film filmmaker with much experience was uh, arrested for no reason in Egypt. Uh, it's now going on two months, I think. So. It's a question that's come up already a number of times during the festival. People want more information about the situation involving John Grace. And, there is a very um, active community um, in Canada internationally um, doing a lot of work to put pressure uh, to, to, to have them released. So you can find, you can find, what, what is the website, Alexis? TarakAndJohn.com. TarakAndJohn.com. And I think uh, John's sister is very actively involved in, in running that website. Um, so. Thank you. Again, thank you for your time and thank you to our panelists and the presenters.